Welcome. In this lecture, I'm going to quickly talk about um, the life history of the Paleozoic. Um, when we start out, what we're looking at in this screen, it's just kind of a quick review of the Cambrian paleogeography. Um, so on the right side, what we actually have is a look at the North American continent um, with a rough estimate of the paleo equator. Now we want to remember that um, North America is part of Laurentia, so we can see that it's here sitting in this reconstruction by Scotis, um, that it's sitting right at the equator and it is rotated slightly. We have a small part of the Canadian Shield that's open, and then we have a lot of marine environments around a couple of isolated islands. We have a sandy bottom and the carbonate island. So the question is, what was going on during the Cambrian time? So as you recall, hopefully, um, the very beginning of the Cambrian saw the start of the SOC sequence. So this is that global transgression. As the sea level began to rise up onto the craton, we started to see the uh, creation of new shallow sea habitats. This allowed created new niche space. So organisms have new places that they can live. So we start to see organisms starting to evolve. Um, during the Cambrian, almost all modern invertebrate phyla that we see today appear. Um, we see the presence of hard parts and this is there because of predation. So prior to this time, most things had soft body parts. Um, if you're not getting eaten by things, then having a soft body isn't too much of a big deal. If everybody's sort of eating small things, they're not gonna bother each other. Um, but being soft-bodied makes you a very tempting thing to eat. So now we remember that life kind of um, changes depending on what nutrients we start to consume. And if you're an organism that starts to eat something else, you develop some hard parts, some way to chomp something down and consume something, then you're going to start to be able to survive better. Now in return, organisms will start to grow hard parts. Um, not, you know, they can't say, hey, I want hard parts. But organisms that might have had some genetic differences that cause their sur outer surface to become harder would be more likely to survive predation and then pass their genes for those harder parts onto their offspring and that's how we see that starting to happen. So anyway, hard parts become very common. We see our trilobites are really cool. I'll just kind of hold one up quickly because it's fun to look at them. So we see trilobites that show up. We see inarticulate brachiopods. We see archaeocyathids. Um, the most classic thing that we talk about um, with the Cambrian fauna is the Burgess Shale. This was discovered in 1909 by Charles Walcott just outside of Field in British Columbia. And here we actually have preservation of soft-bodied um, parts on different organisms. And these organisms are pretty wild. I'm going to see actually if I can quickly move my... Oh, I guess I can't do that. I just realized my picture is right in front of this. Um, oops kind of go back. So um, we also do start to see the very first fish um, showing up at the late part of the Cambrian. So these are ostracoderms, our anathan jawless fish. They became the anathans that we know today like the lamprey and the hagfish. Um, to give you an idea of what the Cambrian looks like, this is just a scene from one of the exhibits um, at um, the Drumheller, um, the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller um, in Alberta, um, up in Canada. And this is just looking at some of those Burgess shale fauna that they start to see. Um, you have Pacaea that was kind of floating around. Um, and then we have the really big Anomalocaris and we have some Morella. Now, the nice thing about this diorama is you can see things that do have soft parts and we do see Anomalocaris, which represents that really big predator and gives us this idea that organisms are eating each other. And in that process, we start to see this kind of radiation, the emergence of new forms during this time. All right, following the Cambrian, we get into the Ordovician. So again, I like to kind of look, okay, where is everything? What did it look like? And then we'll talk about what was around. So if we go up through here, we can see that Laurentia is still situated right at the equator. We have less of the craton that's exposed in North America. Okay, so we've gone through that, that sea level rise. Okay, and so we can see there's lots of places for carbonate, um, carbonate deposition. 
Um, the Ordovician was a very active time. Um, this is when we start to get into that Tippecanoe transgression. That started in the Middle Ordovician. We have new niches that are starting to form. Um, a lot of people like to call this the marine invertebrate biodiversification event. And that's because we see brachiopods, we see bryozoans, and corals starting to diversify. So kind of an example, we can just kind of look, I've just got a couple of, whoops, that's not one. Um, a couple of cool brachiopods. I just like to hold stuff up. <laughs> so we can just look at, so diversification, new forms, new species, okay? Um, and that's just because we have more niche space. Um, what is everybody eating is a good question. So the architarchs are organic walled phytoplankton. These were very common. We do find these microfossils preserved in sediments. Um, and this is what all of these filter feeders are eating. We're sucking the stuff out of the sea and we're starting to consume that. Um, our reef builders are our tabulate and our rugose corals. We have bryzoans and stromatoporids um, that are really making up those big or, uh, ordovician reefs. And now on land, we do have some exposed land and things aren't quite there either. We have our first non-vascular plants and they start to show up in the middle to late Ordovician. All right, so a quick look at what the reefs look like. We see lots of different groups. We have our cephalopods, trilobites. We have those um, horn corals. Okay, and then we also have kind of the chain corals that we're looking at here. This is Halicides. Um, this is one of the tabulate corals. And then Heliophyllum is a representative of one of those horn corals or those solitary rugose corals, what we would see like right here. Okay, so kind of a look at what the Ordovician Sea looks like. A pretty active time. Lots of cool stuff going on. Um, now at the end of the Ordovician, we do have a mass extinction event. Um, more than 100 families of marine invertebrates go extinct. Um, so about 50% of all of the North American brachiopods and bryozoans that we saw during the Ordovician are no longer present during the Silurian. Um, this whole mass extinction event, they don't know exactly what happens, but um, some people think it might have been triggered by the extensive glaciation at the South Pole in Gondwana. So it started to cool off the surface waters um, and that makes it a little bit more of a stressful place for organisms to live, um, specifically the primary producers, those acrotarchs, um, the things that were getting eaten by everything else. If you don't have enough food, you're not gonna live. And so that can actually lead to the demise of a of a species. Okay, now we get into the Silurian. Um, we'll kind of go back up here. We can see Laurentia still hanging out here. We do have some more land exposed and some highlands. So we have that taconic orogeny going on. We can see the Michigan Basin with its barrier reef starting to sit around it. All right, during the Silurian, um, we see brachiopods, bryzoans, gastropods, bivalves, corals, crinoids, and graptolites. Um, they all start to rebound at the beginning of the Silurian. We do go through another period of major reef building. Um, this time we actually see the reefs really focused in our stromatoporids, our tabulate, and then colonial rugose corals. Um, this does represent the end of the Tippecanoe sequence. We also start to see the first appearance of jawed fishes, so the acan uh, acanthodians, excuse me, and the placoderms. The placoderms I like, I'm gonna actually talk more about them in the Devonian. Um, and on land, we do start to see our first vascular plants. The picture that we have here is an image of Cooksonia. This is from the Upper Silurian and it was found in West South Wales, excuse me. And so we can actually see that very simple vascular form. So these would have been small plants that would have just been living along um, above the sea. Now looking at the Silurian Reef, if you want to think about one creature to remember from the Silurian at this time would be the Eurypterids. These were the um, um, the scorpion-like arthropods. They were marine and you can see they had pinchers and they kind of swam through big predators at this time. All right, now into the Devonian, we can see um, we have um, North America is situated here, still again right at the equator, kind of rotating a little bit. Um, we have the Caledonian Highlands. Um, we can see the Antler Highlands, so we have some mountain building going on. We're starting to see the Carbonate Platform. It's getting a little bit smaller because of this, and we can see that Gondwana is getting closer and closer to Laurasia. Okay.
Um, so a lot was happening during the Devonian. Um, so we are in the Kaskaskia sequence. We do have major reef building continuing with those stromatoporids and our corals. Um, we have Ammonoids start to evolve and diversify. Um, these are really cool creatures. So they evolve from nautilus, uh, the nautiloids, um, and they do have very distinct sutures on their edges. And then depending on the patterns of the sutures, we can actually figure out which species we're looking at it. And it makes them an excellent guide fossil for the Devonian through the Cretaceous time when they were very present. And then again, just remember guide fossils, an important thing is that they're widespread, um, but they're very easy uh, widespread geographically, shorter geologic time period, so those different sutures only show up in specific time periods, but they're found in lots of places and they're very easy to recognize. That makes them a good guide fossil. Fish start to evolve like crazy, which is why the Devonian is called the age of fish. So we have our chondrichthys, which are cartilaginous fish. They start, they show up in the Devonian. Cartilaginous fish are your skates, rays, and sharks. We have our osteichthys, our bony fish. Um, these include the actinopterygii, which are our ray fin fish, and our sarcopterygii, which are our lobed fin fish. These involve our coelacanths. My kids have some very fun toys. So we have a coelacanth. They also um, involve the lungfish and the crossopterygians. Okay, um, during this time, the Devonian, we do have a lot of our armored fish that are showing up. So I have Dunkleosteus um, right here. He's just a really cool guy um, that you can check out. Um, we do see our first tetrapods that start to show up. So we have our first footprints that we can see in the middle Devonian. We have Ichthyostega, which is the very first known amphibian. He shows up in the upper part of the Devonian. And then we have Tiktaalik, which shows up in the late Devonian about 375 million years ago, dated on the rocks that are around it. Um, and Tiktaalik is an intermediate fossil that's um, between the crossopterygian, those lobed fin fish, um, and tetrapods, so four-limbed critters living on land. We also have insects, spiders, and snails living on land. Um, and our vascular plants during the Devonian, they start to go from being small forms to much taller, like tree-sized things, um, big, tall things. Um, and we have our first seeds, um, which represents that we likely had gymnosperms at this time, those seed-bearing plants. OK, so the Devonian oceans, what did we see? Um, Sadly, I put my picture right here in front of this, but we do have um, our ammonites with the pretty suture patterns. We have our armored fish. So this is looking at all the different fish that were around in the late Devonian. So we have placoderms, we have cartilaginous fish, we have ray fin fish, and then um, dunkleosteus, which is that gigantic placoderm guy right here. Just so cool. Um, so again, the teeth here, these were just modifications on the bones that were coming forward, so no actual teeth. Um, and then we can see kind of what the, the ocean looked like at this time. Lots of corals, um, ammonites swimming around, cephalopods, all sorts of stuff. On land in the Devonian, we have ichthyostega crawling around. Okay, we do start to see organisms, it's thought that our lobed fin fish started to move. So why are these, the lobed fin fish, why are they kind of tied into this idea of um, our tetrapods? Um, the thought was that we had some shallow areas and organisms that could breathe air would start to move around a little bit and they would migrate from watery place to watery place briefly going out of, up onto land and then back into water where they preferred to be. And then kind of a look at what the Devonian landscape looked like above. We do see some of those smaller plants and then again towards the end of the Devonian getting much, much taller. All right, so the Devonian ended with a mass extinction. We did see a collapse of all of the reef communities globally. Um, our land-dwelling seedless vascular plants were largely unaffected, and our tropical marine groups were more severely affected. Okay, in the oceans, those communities that were towards the poles were not as affected. So the thought is that this was probably a period of global cooling. Um, and because it was global cooling, the marine organisms, things that need those warm, shallow seas, um, 
if they can't survive very well, they're going to start to see their populations starting to go down. So those organisms that couldn't handle the cooler temperatures, they died. And then the things that could handle cooler temperatures, those things more towards those higher latitudes, would migrate down towards the poles. So um, anyway, that gets us to the end of the Devonian. And I will continue this in our next lecture.